Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be joined by Anna Dixon today. Anna is the CEO of Aging Better, which is uh, a topic that is very close to all of our hearts, I think. Um, so, uh, Anna, it's it's great to have you with us. Uh, um, I, I know that you're looking at sort of significant issues around uh, age and ability and uh, participation in uh, society and, and technology, etc. So, um, can you tell us how you came to be working in this field and 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 and, and, and a little bit about your background? Yeah, so um, I've been the chief exec of the Centre for Aging Better for four years, and that is the same age as the organisation. So uh, we set it up from scratch, um, and it's got a very positive uh, vision that we create a society here in England uh, that is a great place for people to grow old and that people can enjoy their later life. So it's really focused on how we can um, enable people, particularly uh, those who are approaching later life, so broadly people in their 50s and 60s, to um, and those that who are at risk of sort of perhaps missing out on a good later life, and um, see what changes we can make both in policy and practice. And um, I came to this from a background in health and social care, but we touch on issues including housing, employment, uh, communities and health. So it's a really broad and fascinating area. Yeah, and I, and I, and I think um, you know we often talk about aging on this show because we know that age and disability are often interrelated. Um, so I guess that brings us on to the f first topic. You know, why for you is positive inclusion of disabled people relevant to the work of Aging Better? Yeah, well, as you say, um, of course the two uh, do intersect. Uh, we try to challenge some of the ageist stereotypes. So, of course, you know, disability is not an inevitable part of ageing. On the other hand, the prevalence and conditions uh, increase with age, and we know that lots of people um, with these sort of slow onset conditions do um, then develop disabilities. Um, uh, and we also know that there are going to be many, many more uh, people living longer and more older people. So estimates suggest that in the next 20 years, uh, one in four people in the UK will be over 65. So um, this is going to be a growing issue. And so we want uh, to make sure that society is inclusive for people of all ages and abilities. And um, so that's really our focus. And obviously that touches on all sorts of areas of life, you know, how people can stay in work uh, for longer, um, and what needs to happen in the workplace in terms of employers. It affects our homes where we live, um, the design of, of, of our housing, um, again, to enable people to remain independent. And then broader communities, you know, how can we make sure that people can continue to contribute, to participate? Um, and so sort of, you know, as I say, that whole idea of positive inclusion is, is critical to all the work we're, we're doing. Excellent, thank you. And um, I, th I think that uh, I, I actually live in an area which is, um, you know, of a very aged demographic. Um, we're in retirement. The South Coast is is like the retirement area of the UK. So I'm about three day, decades younger <laughs> than than most of the people in my village. But inclusion is really important. We're lucky. That there is a you know there is a real village life and there's a community here, but that's not always the case in 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 other parts of the UK. So um, you know that must be something that 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 is of concern to you when you're looking at how do we keep people um, mm -hmm. engaged and active and all of the rest of it. Yeah. So certainly in the UK, uh, you're right to say a lot of the rural and particularly coastal areas are sort of ahead in terms of this demographic shift, having already um, got a very high proportion of um, people at uh, older ages. But the fact is that over the next 20 years, pretty much everywhere is going to look <laughs> like those places do today. So um, we are supporting um, a movement of what we call age friendly communities. 
Um, so there's a UK network. It's a global movement, though, supported by the World Health Organization. And exactly as you describe, it is about um, communities often led by the local authority, the local government, but including um, active citizens as well. And it's really about taking a, f a future a approach to how to make the place more inclusive. And so that does mean looking at things like transport, which is critical in rural areas, um, what's going on, you know, in terms of activity, how um, much support there is for, uh, for community activity, uh, looking at things like the, the housing and opportunities for volunteering, for example. So, um, you know, I think there are places that are, uh, have seen the, the sort of need to do that, but we're trying to encourage uh, all parts of the UK to become age-friendly communities so that they're ready in a sense, um, and not only helping older people today, but future generations as, as the demographic changes uh, happen. Excellent. Deborah, you had a question. Well, I, I have a comment. I, I love the work that you're doing, Anna. I think it's very mm -hmm. important. And I know that in the United States, uh, of course, you know, we like every other, you know, uh, you know, countries, uh, we are also aging very quickly in the United yep. States now. Um, all of the baby boomers are over the age of 55. And every single day for the next few years, we're going to have 10,000 Americans turning 65. And according yep. to as you said, just because you age, you're aging doesn't mean that you're going to acquire a disability. But according to our AARP, our American Association of Retired Persons, um, over the age of 65, about 46 percent of Americans do acquire uh, disabilities that impact our ability yeah. to use technology and other things. And so it, it's a very and we, we had a, um, a guest that Antonio had brought in. Um, with uh, his, his name is Rob Newhouser with Siemens, and he talked about having five generations in the workforce. And I forget mm -hmm. how many employees they have, hundreds of thousands of employees in ATOS, actually. Mm -hmm. Neil had mentioned that it's the same way with them as well. But it, the really understand, it's almost like we have to rethink what it means to age. Because I know I'm now a woman of a certain age, I'm now 60. And I decided to stop fighting my hair, coloring my hair because I was thinking, why are you coloring your hair? And so I decided to go let it grow natural. And then I added some purple just to make it fun. But it feels like we need to redefine what it means to be to, of a certain age. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to embrace the elders, you know. So what responsibility do you think we have um, once we, I mean, what did society really, you know, do we, yep. should we have to make sure that we are appreciating as we age ourselves and then at the same time working with the younger generation? Because I see so much still, oh, the millennials, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and I see my age group attacking the millennials and back and forth, the millennials, blah, get out of the workforce. What are you doing? But what yep. can we do to help people be just okay with whatever age we're at? I know that's well, I mean, question. firstly, to, uh, to say, Deborah, I totally agree this is a global issue. So um, the, obviously we work here in the UK, but we share this uh, challenge or opportunity, depending which way you look at it, with pretty much all developing, um, sorry, developed countries, industrialized countries. Uh, obviously, places like Japan and Singapore are further ahead on that age shift. Other countries are coming very hot on our heels. Some of the uh, rapidly um, industrializing and, uh, countries like Brazil are not far behind us. So this is truly a global issue. And um, thankfully, some um, uh, countries have recognized um, that they need to do something about it uh, and are putting forward much more positive uh, national strategies uh, focused on uh, productive aging, active aging, successful aging, they call it different things. And I think that's really critical because as you say, um, our experience has changed beyond recognition. So we're living at least 10 years longer than our parents' generation, 20 years longer than our grandparents' generation. And recently statistics out in the UK looking at how healthy we are at different ages, basically we're saying that you know, 70 is the new 65. So if you look at how healthy people were 10 years ago, 
um, at 65, that's now at 70. So the good news is we're living longer, but also we're staying healthy um, uh, longer. But we still do have quite a long period where people do have disability in later life. And so it's really critical that we do make these changes in society, that we have new products and services. And I think there is a big issue that business and employers, as you say, have not yet woken up. One to the fact that actually a very high proportion of their workforce are over 50. So what does that mean for an employer? And we're doing lots with some leading employers to develop the evidence base about what they should be doing, but also products and services. I mean, you mentioned the sort of beauty industry or the anti-aging products, but we can extend that to um, the housing products. There's still a lot of specialist with care um, products uh, being developed rather than attractive mainstream inclusive products for the home that could allow people with disability um, uh, and uh, to live independently as they age. Oh, well said, well said. And, you know, it, it is interesting that the beauty and the anti-aging and all that stuff, and once again, defining that it, it, you know, when the day, it seemed like the day that I turned 60, and I saw an article that was, that said, 60 is the new 50. And I think sometimes that is used to make things a little bit more difficult because one thing, you know, I don't want, I want people that are 50 to be cool with being 50, people that are 20 to be good with 20, people that are 60. So there's, there's so many nuances associated with this. And I, I really know that you're correct in that the employers don't know what to do, but I do know that the aging the, you know, what we've been predicting and what we've been saying for many, many years was going to happen has happened. And I was speaking to a global bank a few, um, about six weeks ago, and they were really, really freaked out. They had done a lot of efforts with inclusive design, accessibility, making sure that people with disabilities were including, but now many of their high net worth individuals were aging into disabilities. And they were finding that they could not meet the needs of these, you know, these clients that they really want to meet the needs, not to mention also many of their executives are experiencing, um, you know, it, it's just part of aging. So it, it's yeah. really important, that, first of all, that we come together, which is why we're so honored to have you on the program, because we need to bring the disability inclusion, the aging, all of it together, not as yep. a negative. And I, that you're going to get, but right. Go ahead. Yeah. So, no, I, I agree. And in, in the workplace, that's really critical. I think one of the challenges is that a lot of older workers who do have slow onset do not self-identify as having a disability. And that makes it quite difficult. They don't raise it with their line manager. They do, therefore don't make the uh, requests that they are entitled to for adjustments. They would definitely have to make common cause. We've set out many things that I think would help um, people with disability in the workplace, regardless of age. Uh, so number one is flexibility. Really important for anybody who's managing a health condition, who's got caring responsibilities, all sorts of flexibility. It turns out that people want, you know, not only their hours, where they work, um, uh, but they also need to think about job roles and how they can be um, flex. Uh, we're looking at how people with health conditions can be better supported in the workplace. Um, again, having those open conversations to disclose, really understanding what they can do to adapt the workplace to support people. We're also looking at age bias in recruitment. So obviously age is a what we call a protected characteristic. So um, along with um, race and gender and disability. And so it's not something that should be being used to discriminate. But we know that um, uh, there are issues about people being turned down for jobs um, because of their uh, age. And so, again, I think trying to look at how the recruitment process can eliminate biases of all types um, is going to be really significant. And again, um, making sure that uh, age or, or disability are not uh, used to discriminate. We, you talked about the number of different ages in generations in the workplace. So there's just something about managing a diverse workforce. And there's evidence coming out that a more diverse workforce is generally a better for performing workforce. More ideas, you know, um, greater uh, productivity. 
So I think we, you know, we need to empower managers to be able to manage those age diverse teams. And then finally, having ongoing career conversations, not writing people off when they're 50 and saying, you know, oh, well, you haven't got long left thinking that they might have 20 more years of, of work. So how can we have conversations with people about training, progression, development, so that they can continue to contribute effectively to the workforce? So I think these are common things globally for all employers um, you know, to be thinking about. And I definitely think those things would also benefit younger people with disability as much as they would um, uh, older workers. I don't know if you wanted to pick up as well housing, because um, yes, I do well, think that yeah, that's another will. area. Yeah. 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 But I think Antonio had a. Yeah. But I think An Antonio had a uh, a question. No, um, I I was um, I, I was about, but but I think I changed it a, li a little bit in, in order to be more uh, to follow to follow the the context where we're going. Um, I, I've I've seen organizations. Doing event, employee events where they they rented a, a football stadium. They put, they have put a lot of balloons, so all the millennials were playing on the balloons, and everyone else was drinking beer because they didn't want to run and go mad around the, around the the, the the other type of activities. So sometimes organizations, when they do these type of activities for employees, they consider a group, but they they don't consider the needs of everyone else. So and the other, they're just trying to find <laughs> something that suits them. I, but, I, I, but, sorry, go on, yes, Antonio. No, no, please. So uh, yeah, I think there is a, a a focus in a lot of businesses, and how can we make our workplace really attractive to the millennials? And they're competing for a diminishing number of people. The facts are that there are, you know, fewer people coming into the workforce each year. Um, you know, as it were, leaving school and university and many, many more who are leaving at the other end due to retirement. And there's just not enough to replace them. And so businesses have got a really, um, I think, the wrong sort of workforce um, approach if all they're doing is trying to make their workplaces attractive to millennials. Um, with, I think they need to be thinking about attracting workers of all ages. And that's not to say that, you know, they all want totally different things. As I said, I think that many people want the same things out of work. And um, I think employers are perhaps foolish to think that uh, by, you know, sometimes doing gimmicky things, this is going to attract millennials. To, actually, they also want flexibility. They also want uh, people to invest in their lifelong learning and career opportunities. You know, they like um, as well to have autonomy and control. So, I actually think that most people want the same thing in work. Indeed, that's what our evidence suggests. Um, the one thing that older workers seem to value maybe more than younger workers is the social contact. They like work for social reasons. Um, so uh, otherwise, I think we all want pretty much the same thing. No, no, I, 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 I agree. I, I, and sometimes uh, uh, those who, 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 who creating uh, who, when you ask employees, they pretty much want the same things, but somehow there's this kind of a bias, sometimes coming from a perception, coming from the startup world, that you need to go cool things just to, the, just to attract people. So, and, and that uh, sometimes is something that corporates and uh, end up doing just because it's what is being trending around a certain groups uh, around human resources. Yeah, I agree. So, so um, uh, we know on, that you you have a particular focus on homes. Mm -hmm. um, so what are you uh, doing in, in this area, and why why do you think it's so important uh, in the positive inclusion of disabled people in in this area? So in particular for older um, adults, they spend more time in their home. Um, so particularly after retirement, when people perhaps stop work, and so it's really critical that the place where they live supports them to continue to have a full, independent and purposeful life. We also know, though, the home can be a hazard to our health. So cold and damp homes uh, creating um, health issues, but also hazards causing falls, uh, which are a result not only of people dying, but also 
um, of disability. And um, at the moment it, here in the UK, and I, I, I don't know the, the figures so well about um, uh, the US or other countries, a very, very small percentage. So 7% of our homes currently meet even the most basic accessibility standard, which only means that they're visitable by somebody with a mobility issue. You know, if you start to actually say fully wheelchair accessible or people that could live in uh, in those homes with mobility issues, it's a tiny, tiny percent. So we've got to change that. The projected figures of the number of households where somebody will be over the age of 65 are projected to um, grow hugely. And so it's really critical for those people that we build all new homes to much higher accessibility standards. And that's what we're campaigning for here in the UK. So we're joined together with other housing organisations, including those that um, have in the past been more focused on um, disability, to join forces to call on the government to increase the um, re regulations so that there is a higher level of accessibility in all new homes that are built in this country. So I think that's the number one uh, big issue is if we can at least get all, more of the new homes built to the standards. And then, of course, we've got to adapt some of our current homes because, you know, most of the homes that people are going to be living in for the next, you know, probably 50 years are already um, built. And um, in that area, we're looking at uh, home adaptations. And what we've um, done through our research is we've seen that people delay putting them into their homes until they're really in a crisis. And this is partly because they look very clinical and ugly and um, they're not they're not things that are mainstream or well-designed products. And so again, we think there's a lot to do to um, change really the retail offer so that if you're redoing your bathroom or kitchen, whatever your age, but particularly say if you're in your 50s, you should be getting the right advice from the mainstream providers about how to design that so that it can be accessible, whether that's an eye level oven, the design of the taps. There's so many things that could be done that would be nice products that everybody could have in their home that would also work for people with um, uh, varying uh, disability. So that's the sort of um, direction that we're going on housing, both making sure that new homes are built to be accessible, which would benefit people of all ages uh, with disability, and also trying to make sure that as people uh, refurbish their home, that there are adaptations and products available that are more attractive um, than those that are currently available. And I, I was uh, talking with people uh, um, a few uh, uh, months ago here in, 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 in Ireland about social housing and housing for people with disabilities. And what they were saying is, no, well, um, we are entitled to social housing, but usually what happens is we are entitled to a home, but then we only visit that home once it's ready, so we go, we go, we have access to get the keys, and then we go and ask for our own accommodation needs. So it means that they need to retrofit a new home because they never engaged with the people who are going to live in the house before. How do you see that in the UK? Well, I think um, there are um, there is a need to co-design these products. Uh, with people um, with disability themselves. I, I would agree with that. But we do have some quite good technical standards already. And so there is something about adopting the technical standards that we already have. Um, I think in addition to that, we need to recognize, particularly for older people with disability, that many of them are homeowners. And so they are not in social housing. Um, there is an issue a, about the supply of specialist social housing for people with disability, whether there's enough of it, whether it's well enough designed. But the majority of uh, older people are homeowners, and so they, on the whole, have to take the responsibility themselves for adapting their home. And that's why we think the market needs to change to provide those people with the products and services that are going to allow them to be able to adapt their own homes. Uh, rather than what happens at the moment, which is that they stay in those homes, have a very poor quality of life until they really can't live there any longer. And then um, adaptations may be paid for by um, 
uh, what's called the Disabled Facilities Grant um, through the local authority, or they have to pay it for themselves for the adaptations, or they get stuck in hospital, or they end up getting admitted to a care home, none of which are great outcomes. No, and um, I remember that we were first introduced actually by the Design Council, so you've been doing yeah. work with the Design Council on improving the design of all of this stuff. So I, um, I'm i very much of the opinion that we can have beautiful, accessible stuff and yeah. that you can you know, have a grab rail that doesn't look like it's something out of a hospital. Why? No one yeah. wants to live in a home that looks like a hospital ward. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and there's no reason why we can't have good design. And it should, you know, you go to a hotel, they always have a grab rail in the bathroom. It's beautifully designed. It's all just part of the, the bathroom suite. So why is it not when we go and buy a new bathroom suite that these things are not just um, the standard product? Certainly the Design Council, they have a program called Spark where they're funding early stage innovators in terms of designing uh, products. We also um, have recently in the UK, um, the government have are funding an innovation fund uh, with the um, purpose of stimulating the market to bring forward new products and services and to scale existing products and services that are going to better meet the, the needs of um, an aging population. And part of that and the big message that we've um, been in advising them is saying, make sure you do co-design with the people, the end users of these products, and make sure that they are inclusive and attractive so that they're things that everybody would want um, to be using. So I think that this, this is where, for me, the sort of positive inclusion agenda around disability and that around ageing absolutely come together. Yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, one of our former colleagues that's actually um, moved from IT into appliance manufacturing. So he's, um, he's working for a Spanish uh, appliance homeware manufacturer called Teca now and looking at how they can you know, start doing inclusive design and start actually um, and one of the key things was that they, they're realizing that they're putting in all of these sort of appliances with loads of features that no one uses. Because once you get past two or three steps, it becomes t too difficult. Mm -hmm. So it's working out sort of what do people really need? And, and as you say, co-design that, that, that makes these things livable. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I always joke about my, my cheapo microwave, but I love it because it's got two dials. One is you set the <laughs> the strength of cooking. The other is time. That's it. And away you go. It's yeah. even the I can operate that, it. Yeah, the idea that we all love this complexity is such nonsense. We probably, most of us, really good products that are simply designed can work for everybody. And I think that there's sort of, we got to get that into the, the, the teaching of uh, design schools and architecture practices and planners, so that they are all understanding um, the, this this different approach. Yeah, and, 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 and just to follow up, and I will hand over to Deborah because I'm now hogging the mic. Um, essentially, what we, I think we need to design for, you know, successful completion. You know, it's task completion that we want to look at here, um, rather than how many things can you do? It's like, well, what are the things you really need to do and can everyone do them well rather than, you know, oh, can I set my kettle so that it achieves a temperature of 93 degrees, which will make me the perfect cup of tea after 15 little presses on the thing and a lot of beeps. Yeah. Over to you, Deborah. It's, I think that we're all jockeying to talk to you, Anna, because we love this topic. And, you know, aging in place, that, that's something that, you know, we as baby boomers in the United States and certainly all over the world want to do. You, you talk about, you know, these homes and stuff. Another thing we didn't talk about, they're so expensive. They're so expensive. I remember my mother, uh, who has now passed away, my mother went into a home and she was having to pay $6,000 every single month. And I know some people that are paying $12,000. And it's, you know, yay, if you happen to have that money. I mean, it, my mom started going, my mom worked her whole life for this money. And it, it just, it, it was just going through it 
and you know so but the aging in place and then you know also all of the technology i i was talking to an executive of a very 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 large corporation the other day who actually got injured and is in a wheelchair right now she's going to she's going to be able to get out of her wheelchair in a few years as she gets stronger but she was in uh, Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States. Um, she went to 28 different apartments and homes and townhouses, and none of them were accessible. And we've had our Americans with Disabilities Act since 19, I mean, well, 1990, 30 years. And she had to go to 29. And she was trying to open the bathroom door in her corporation. She couldn't open the door in her wheelchair. And she's like, this is ridiculous. And she yep. went to a colleague who's in a wheelchair. She's like, how do you do it? Well, I try to be strategic. So I watch my, my fluid, you know, how much I drink. And yep. I wait till the time when people are going to be, what are we doing here? Inclusive yep. design works for everybody. Everybody benefits from the inclusive yep. design. And the aging, I think, Anna, we have been talking about disability inclusion in our careers, 30 years, all of us, even longer. But I think the aging of our societies, this is what's going to get everybody's attention. And and then on top of it, another thing that scares me a bit, and we're actually going to, we've gotten involved in this conversation, but we are trying to start legislating the voice technologies in the United States. There's legislation in California, there's two pending in Illinois, and we're very concerned about the impact it's going to have on the, you know, our senior citizens and on people with disabilities, because mm -hmm. I get it. We don't want everybody snooping and privacy. And I, I, I'm for all that too. But in some ways, I think that that cat's already out of the bag. I mean, it's already happening. So the technologies have to learn so we can use them to stay independent in our homes, our smart homes, our smart devices. So there's all these things converging, Anna, and I know you're doing amazing work in the UK, but how do we address all the things that are coming together, in, including what we already talked about? Um, obviously, we need to have you on the show like 25 times. <laughs> there's so much to talk about. Isn't it? Yeah. I know, yeah, that, it's yeah. a huge yeah. topic. There is. And it's so, happening so, now. I really think that we have to um, wake people themselves up to this. So there's lots that policymakers and uh, business can do, but we do have to wake individuals up to this. For the points that you make, that if their home is not able to support them to age in place, they are going to be having to pay very high care fees. So we need to get people to be investing in adapting their homes earlier in their life with the understanding that that's going to enable them to receive care into their home and potentially stay there right through to the end. I mean, depending on, you know, whether they have dementia or it depends on their needs. But for many, many more people, if their home were well adapted, they could stay with the right care and support coming in in that home right through until they die. So and that is probably what most people want, number one. And two, as you say, it will save them money and their families. Uh, from those uh, care fees of having to go into an institutional um, setting. So we do need to sort of make uh, wake people up to this. We need to get them to take action. We need the products and services to be there, to be well marketed and retailed to them. Um, but as you say, the problem at the moment is that when planners are thinking about how many of these homes, they tend to be thinking very narrowly, like how many people with disability are there and what do we think the numbers will be in the future? And then we just need that many specialist housing. I mean, you need to get away from that because, as you've said, often those don't fully meet the needs of people with very high and specialist um, needs. And you can't match people up. You know, the places they want to be and the places that those homes are don't often match up. People want to stay where they know people, where they've got community around them. And so it's really critical that uh, more of the homes are built to these standards, that they're much more easy to adapt to particular people's needs as they change and that we just have it as a default that all homes are built to these standards and then we need estate agents to be making that information available to consumers so that if people like your friend are looking for uh, somewhere that's going to be suited to their needs there is some sort of kite mark or something that indicates this home meets lifetime standards accessible standards 
So actually, if I'm 70 and I'm looking to move and I haven't got an issue now, but I want to buy somewhere that's going to you know, last me for the rest of my life, that should be something that the market is signaling as a product. And I think there's demand there for it. At the moment, that demand is not being met. And we see that in the data. There are half the number of, of people moving in their 60s and 70s than there are at other ages. And what's happening is people are waiting until a crisis and then they're having to make a crisis move. And that's not what people want to do. So I, I think that the numbers, um, uh, you know, uh, are changing so rapidly in the numbers of, of older people that, um, you know, this has got to be a great opportunity to really get inclusive homes um, um, uh, built in large numbers. No, uh, I've seen in Europe we are... Um adding uh, things like uh, the, uh, the energy standards in housing where are able to measure a house by the, the level of elect uh, electricity and sustainability standard that can provide and i think it seems that could be done something similar in terms of uh, in terms of accessibility you could identify if a certain house would be accessible under a certain level and when you are buying the house you were you were able to see that and make that decision. I think this is something that very interesting to bring to the real estate market. And and you no, know, we're not talking about something that will go away. The trend is here to stay. And I think this is something with some interesting potential to be worked on. And I think it could go even further as the uh, uh, idea of age-friendly communities takes hold. I think in the US, the AARP have done a livability index, which is there and available to the public so if you want to choose even where you might live um, if you're thinking about moving community um, thinking about whether the place that you're moving is age friendly you know is the transport accessible and you get around the town center in terms of the crossing times drop curbs you know are there um, uh, is it is it somewhere that is inclusive and accessible to people of all ages and abilities and we, uh, in supporting the age-friendly communities here in the UK, have got them doing things like walking audits. So they go around and identify problems in the environment, uh, draw those to the attention of the, um, the local government uh, to try and uh, introduce perhaps seating, change the crossing times, that sort of thing. Uh, another area that we work with, the Isle of Wight, they've been doing training for bus drivers. So the bus drivers can um, understand if somebody just needs to show a card and they'll know if they've got a, a site problem. So they'll um, speak out the name of the stop. Uh, they'll know if they have a mobility. So they will wait until the person is seated, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's led to quite significant uh, changes in driver behavior and indeed thinking about the timetabling and routes that some of the transport takes and then the other initiative which seems to have taken off in lots of places and uh, we've got a case study written up on our website um, at uh, agingbetter.org.uk if people want to look at it called take a seat it's really simple it's getting local businesses to put up a sticker just saying you're really welcome to come in and take a seat no obligation to buy and it just gives people with mobility issues the confidence to go out into their town centers, uh, to go out shopping, um, because they know if they need to take a break and sit down, then there will be places where they can do that. So um, there's lots of these small changes uh, in the community that I think uh, can make all the difference to whether people feel confident to go out and about. And we clearly want to make sure that people uh, with disability of all ages can go out and about, and so they don't get uh, socially isolated um, and uh, uh, can continue to participate. So um, we're excited about that and the growth in age-friendly communities, and that is a global movement. So hopefully lots of your uh, people listening in will will uh, encourage the places that they live to also look into that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It's been, it's gone too quickly. I've, I've got <laughs> a raft of other questions that I'm not going to ask now. Uh, because we need to close and, and, and say thank you to our supporters, uh, Barclays Access, Microlink, and, and MyClearText for you know, keeping the lights on and, and keeping us sustained and, and going, and these conversations about inclusion sustained and going over the years. Thank you, Anna. Uh, it's, been, it's been really great. I'm really looking forward to continuing this chat on Twitter. I know that our community is going to really engage on this topic, so you better warm your fingers up. <laughs> yeah.
Great. Uh, I look forward to that. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you.